<laughs> All right, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about these two papers, as is evident from the introduction, uh, with Raphael Busso, where we proved an area law for these surfaces called holographic screens, which are locally defined surfaces that have a distinguished interpretation in terms of the Busso bound. And this proof is in classical GR. And if classical GR is not your cup of tea, not to worry. It's a brief advertisement. We're currently working on generalizing that for semi-classical gravity. So stay tuned. Now, we already have an area law in GR. We've had it, as Ben has informed us, since 1971. It's been very useful. We normally use, we, we think of it, uh, the area of the event horizon is increasing in time. And we associate the event horizon in entropy, which is proportional to its area. And this gives us a way of formulating the generalized law of, of the generalized second law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy of the event horizon plus the entropy of the exterior is increasing in time. This has been a very, very useful law, and even though it's not proven in many space times, it's been very, uh, it's been a very useful and fruitful avenue of research. But it does have some drawbacks, which stem from a definition of the causal horizon or the event horizon. We define it as the boundary of the past of infinity. And this, is, this has some drawbacks, mainly the fact that some space-times don't have an asymptotic boundary. Like, for example, I guess. So can everybody see this? So some space-times don't have an asymptotic boundary. For example, the closed v collapsing universe looks like this. They have some big crunch, some big bang. And this is the North Pole, and that's the South Pole. And since there's no asymptotic boundary, we don't have a way of defining a causal horizon in this space time. So, how do we talk about the generalized second law? It's not clear. Another drawback is, again, related to how we define causal horizons. We define them as the boundary of the future, of, of the boundary of the past of infinity. And that feels somewhat acausal. It's not a local definition in time. What the black hole is doing now, the thermodynamics of the black hole now, depend on what will happen in the far future. And so this is the problem of black hole or general event horizon is teleological. And this isn't immediately a deal breaker, but it would be really nice to have some way of defining, of thinking about thermodynamics which is more local than, the, uh, than something which is, depends on the far future of what it does now. And so we prove an area law for these holographic screens, which are defined with respect to a, an expansion of null geodesics, which is a local quantity, and we define it in some local neighborhood. And so in that sense, these surfaces are local. And the Busso bound has, says that these surfaces are in some sense distinguished. They provide a bound on the entropy of an entire null slice of the space time. And the area of these surfaces, or the area of the surface provides a bound on the entire entropy of an entire <coughs> slice of the space time. And since the entropy is now obeys an area law, this certainly seems to indicate that these surfaces have a, an interesting thermodynamic interpretation. And because they are local, they, in some sense, address these two concerns. So first, I'm going to talk about what holographic screens are. And I'm going to give some examples in a construction. It also turns out that these holographic screens can be thought of as generalizations of these some local notions of event, black hole event horizons, like dynamical horizons and trapping horizons. And so I'll talk a little bit about how this relates to prior work on the subject. Then I'm going to state our area law, and I'll give a mini proof, because the full proof is very long. Uh, you can find it in this paper. The mini proof is just in the context of spherical symmetry, because it's a fairly similar argument, but without all the technical complications of not assuming spherical symmetry. I will talk for a few minutes about what those technical difficulties are and how, uh, roughly speaking, we deal with them. And then I'll talk about the Busso bound for screens, and in particular, what, what do I mean when I say that there is this bound on the entropy of an entire null slice of the space-time. 
And if there's time, I haven't written it because I'm not sure there will be time, if there's time, I'll talk about some future directions. So, holographic screens. So I said that these are defined in terms of the null expansion of GOD6. So let me just remind everyone what uh, what null expansions of GOD6, what null GOD6 look like from some codimension two surface. Suppose we have some codimension two surface. There are four null congruences of GOD6 that can be shot from this surface. So there's the path, the future inwards directed, which I do apologize about the drawing. Uh, future outwards directed, which looks like this. There is the past outwards directed and the past inwards directed. And just to be clear, I'm going to call the vectors that generate this one k and the vectors that generate this one l. Now, the way I've drawn it, this null congruence is expanding and this null congruence is contracting. This is what we call a normal surface. And I'm just going to jot down a table for how we classify different surfaces based on the expansions of null GOD6. So this is surface type and the expansion in the L direction, which I'm going to call inwards, and the expansion in the K direction, which I will call outwards. And so this is a normal surface. What we shoot outwards is expanding, what we shoot inwards is contracting. And so these are strictly negative and these are strictly positive. A trapped surface we think of as a surface where we shoot light rays out, but then somehow they end up coming back in. And so trapped has strictly negative expansion in both the inward ingoing and the outgoing null congruence. This is all future directed, of course. And then we have anti-trapped. And I'm sorry about the vocabulary, vocabulary lesson, but these will actually be important for my definitions. These are just the opposite of trapped surfaces. We can think of them in expanding cosmologies, where both the ingoing null rays and the outgoing null rays are expanding, strictly expanding. And then we have the marginal surfaces which neither trap these light rays nor repel them in a sense. There's a marginal <coughs> trap where they have a strictly negative ingoing expansion and a vanishing outgoing expansion and marginally anti-trapped, which have a strictly zero ingoing expansion and a strictly positive outgoing expansion. And just to be complete, extremal surfaces have vanishing expansion in either direction. <coughs> So what does this have to do with holographic screens? We define a holographic screen in terms of marginally trapped or marginally anti-trapped surfaces, depending on the kind of holographic screen we're considering. So yes, future, a future holographic screen, which is the one that can in some sense be thought of as a local black hole boundary, is simply a surface, a co-dimension one surface. which is foliated by marginally trapped surfaces. <coughs> and we'll call those surfaces leaves. <clears throat> Sorry, Nina. Should I worry that there's no zero minus and plus zero entry in your table, or is that just some redundant? No zero minus? Like, you have a minus I zero. mean, that's just a matter of what you call L and what you call K. But you called one ingoing and one outgoing. Is that important That's, or is that just? It's just my way of, of, you can call them whatever you like. Yeah, this will just be useful later when I talk about, I try to call ingoing something and outgoing something in particular, but um, <coughs> you can switch those if you like, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think it's fair to, we'll always call K the one that's zero and we'll always call L the one yes. that's, that, that's minus. And in black hole type of settings, it'll reduce to the, to yeah, the terminology. And we can define a past holographic screen as a co-dimension one surface which is foliated by marginally anti-trapped surfaces. So past marginally anti-trapped. And you can probably already see why you might think of this as some kind of a local black hole boundary because we think of the black hole as being populated by trapped surfaces and we think of the exterior as being populated by normal surfaces. And so it makes sense in some way to think of the boundary as being foliated by these marginally trapped surfaces. 
the past one, we can think of some kind of, some kind of a cosmological horizon in the case where we have expanding cosmologies. So uh, some examples, because at this point, it's all just definitions. So in the case of a collapsing star, Oppenheimer Schneider, we have this star here, and here's the event horizon. And the holographic screen looks roughly like this, where it begins time-like inside the star, and then it becomes space-like and asymptotes to the event horizon at late times. Okay, so when you say the future holographic screen, do you mean a future holographic screen? Yes, thank you. These are not unique. This is for a particular null foliation of the space-time, which I'll talk about in a second. And an example of a past holographic screen is some uh, matter-dominated flat FRW. Is, and you have this time-like holographic screen. This is the Big Bang singularity. And this is foliated by marginally anti-trapped surfaces. This is foliated by marginally trapped surfaces. And how do we go about constructing these things? Well, it's actually a very nice construction, uh, thanks to Raphael's paper back from 99. She's used start out with uh, a null foliation of the space time. And then you travel along each null slice until you reach a marginally trapped surface. And you take the union of those surfaces. So here, we have this null foliation. And at each intersection here with the holographic screen, this is a marginally trapped surface. In this picture, the, the k direction is this one, and this is the l direction. We can do a similar foliation here, where it's just these are the um, these are the null leaves. Well, sorry, can you draw what that would look like if you made it out of a null shell? So if this instead of being a time-like screen, it became it was so no, it, you, instead of being a time-like shell, it was by just sending in a spherical shell of photons. So then, something like. Um, like a Vidya kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So you, you mean you had some null? Yeah. I think the screen would look something like, it would just look something like this if it were strictly okay, null. Okay, that was what I wanted yeah. to see. Yeah, thanks. OK, so how do these relate to these local black hole boundaries that I was talking about? Well, people have been thinking about how to get rid of this, this problem by uh, thinking about marginally trapped surfaces for some time. The first proposal was uh, the apparent horizon, which is given by, well, taking a Cauchy slice, and then you just take all the trapped surfaces on it, and then you consider the boundary of that. The, it's, it's not clear exactly how to prove an area for this, given that you can wiggle your Cauchy slice in however way you want. So that's not something that, well, that's not something we'll be considering here. But there have been other proposals, in particular this uh, dynamical horizon or future trapping horizon. So these are, these turn out to be just space-like holographic screens, although of course <coughs> these were formulated before holographic screens were, so I shouldn't say that they're special cases of ours. So dynamical horizons or future outwards trapping horizons. Uh, this is Ashtakar and Krishnan. Uh, they wrote a number of papers on this from 02 to 05. And this is Sean Hayward, starting in 93. And these are space-like, essentially space-like holographic screens. So in this picture, the dynamical horizon would be this space-like portion here, but would not include the time-like portion over there. The reason this were very, these were very nice is that they obey an area law. The area of the dynamical horizons increases as you evolve outwards. So as you, you start out here and you evolve outwards towards the black hole exterior along in the direction of the k vectors, then the area of these surfaces will be increasing. This was proved by uh, Ashokar and Krishnan. They also talked about time-like membranes. This is, again, Ashtakar and Krishnan, where they, these were just time-like holographic screens. And these were also shown to obey an area law, but it was a strange area law. The area of these time-like membranes was increasing towards the past. 
So on this holographic screen here, the area would be increasing in this way. These are all for future holographic screens. So for example, this past holographic screen here does not have increasing area in this direction. It's in fact the time reverse. The area is increasing on, on it in this direction. Now, by looking at this holographic screen here, which changes signature, you might notice that, well, it certainly seems like this time-like piece is stitching itself together with this space-like piece so as to conspire to have one uniform area law. And you might ask, is this always the case? And this is what we prove, that indeed, these things always stitch themselves together in such a way that you can travel along one of these screens and always travel, and travel continuously along it and always see increasing area. Is so, it always true that these come from these null foliations? Uh, you can always construct holographic screens from null foliations. Yeah, but Whether every holographic screen defined in this way can be obtained from a null foliations, I don't know the answer to that. So which only you do. It follows from our theorem, right? Well, that's what so I was going to You can always question. construct the orthogonal yeah. pair of that's light right, rays right, through yes. each leaf. Yeah. But it may not and be a null foliation of the well, entire space-time. Well, it will not foliate the whole yes. space-time in yes. general. And, and it doesn't here in this example. It I does think, not, right? yeah. We have this. It doesn't foliate the exterior yeah. of the light. Mm -hmm. but, but the theorem is proven um, for the definition that you wrote. You don't, you don't have to assume the null foliation? We don't have to assume a, that these are constructed from a null foliation, yeah. But why do you say you can always construct one from a null foliation? What if it turns out that the null foliation is just always expanding? Oh. And never expanding. Good. So not, not every null foliation is guaranteed to be Yes, guaranteed. but if you can't construct, I think Daniel's question was the opposite. Do, okay. If you have a holographic screen, can it always be constructed from a null foliation, assuming the existence of it? So the associated null foliation is, is central to the proof in some sense. I mean, to show that no bad things can happen, one always constructs a contradiction using a yield. All right, so let's show that no bad things can happen. Uh, all right, so this is area law. Like every good theorem in GR, you have to assume some conditions to prove it. And in particular, we assume a couple of things. I won't state all of our assumptions, but I'll state a couple of important ones. First, we assume the null curvature condition, which states that for any null vector in the space-time, contracting it with the Ricci tensor twice gives you a non-negative quantity. You can think of this as the null energy condition plus the Einstein equations. And the second thing we assume is a kind of generic condition which is not quite the same as the generic condition that is assumed in the singularity theorems. This generic condition states, is that, states that for any vector k such that, sorry, any vector k on the holographic screen H, such that the expansion in the k direction, which is 1 over the cross-sectional area of the congruence, times derivative of the area uh, with respect to the null, uh, to the affine parameter along the congruence, if this is equal to zero on leaves of the holographic screen, then this quantity, which looks suspiciously like part of the ratio dury equation, is strictly greater than zero. This is uh, the shear. Normally, the shear is called sigma, but we like to call our leaves sigma, so I'm calling it sigma sub s. Physically, what this means is that when we start out, we start out on a leaf on the holographic screen, and we slightly evolve from it in the to, towards the future or towards the past uh, in such a way that the, along this k congruence, then this immediately becomes negative. So it's a little stronger in some sense than the usual generic condition. It's also a little weaker because we're not assuming it for any null vector, just on these particular null vectors on the holographic screen. Okay, so k has to be null. So, uh, yes, sorry, I meant, yes, that's right, any null vector k. In particular, these, this is the, this, that distinguished null vector which has the, uh, the vanishing expansion for the marginally trapped surfaces. Yeah. So that's violated on the horizon of just a static black hole? I'm sorry, what? Is that, is that condition two violated on the horizon of a static black hole? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. 
that that would be a holographic screen if we didn't imply if you didn't assume this generic condition because it's foliated by marginally trapped surfaces, but uh, does not obey this. So when you say a null vector on H, you don't mean that it's tangent to H. You just mean it's living on H. Yes. Yeah. Well, the your thing you're trying to prove is still true, so maybe there's a way to remove this. Uh, you mean if we don't assume this, the area is still going to well, be? Well, sometimes you can do proofs where first you use the generic condition, mm -hmm. and then you use the fact that things uh, continuity as you remove <coughs> the generic condition to say that as long as you only care about proving a strict inequality, not, uh, not a weak inequality, mm -hmm. where it's greater than or equal to, you don't really need the generic condition. That can happen. So. Okay. Well, let's 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 talk about that. Uh, I think the way our contradiction is <coughs> derived requires null rays to focus, but maybe there's a way to get around that. But the point of the generic condition is the vast majority of states that satisfy the null curvature condition will satisfy Yes, that's state. why it's called generic. Yeah. You can add an exponentially small amount of matter if it's not satisfied, and it will be satisfied. Um, but I, I, think, I think I agree. I mean, it should be possible to relax yeah. this somewhat. It's just, just not convenient. It's just not clear exactly how to go about generalizing the, the way the proof is currently constructed, how to go about doing that. And of course, we also assume global hyperbolicity, but that's so often assumed I'm not even going to write it down. <laughs> okay, so now I've told you before, and you kind of have to take my word for it, that this space-like portion obeyed an area law, and this time-like portion obeyed an area law. And so maybe I should convince you that that's true before I go about talking about stitching these things together. So this space-like area law, so space-like case, was first proven, uh, I think, for dynamical horizons by Ashton Krishnan, and I think uh, for future outwards trapping horizons, which are kind of the same thing under the right assumptions by Sean Hayward. And you can show that it's, it's actually a very nice and simple proof. So <coughs> if we have some space-like dynamical horizon, and we consider two leaves which are <coughs> very close to one another, arbitrarily close to one another, called a sigma one, and sigma 2, or if I do the, try to, to be brave and do this in 3D, looks something like this. Okay. And from each one of these, we can shoot the null congruence in the k direction and the null congruence in the l direction. K, l, l, and k. And I'm going to call the direction, th this direction, along the k vector, the outwards direction just so I can call it something. So since the expansion vanishes along the k direction, we can evolve sigma 1 towards this, this surface here, which I will call sigma tilde. And for as long as we're evolving only very little, in other words, as long as these two leaves are very close to one another, the area of sigma 1 will not change. So what this looks like is this, something like this. And because the expansion is neither positive nor negative, the area is not changing. And then we can, so then we have area of sigma 1 is area of sigma tilde. And then we can evolve sigma tilde back towards sigma 2 using the L congruence. Now the expansion in the L direction is negative towards the future, which means it's positive towards the past. And so that means that as we evolve from sigma tilde to sigma 2, the area will be increasing. So something like this. And so if this is sigma tilde, sigma 1, sigma 2, and this here is sigma tilde, it's clear that as we evolve backwards, this has to expand in area. And so we find that the area of sigma 2 is greater than the area of sigma tilde. And so we find that as we evolve in this direction, the area of leaves is increasing. So the, the sign of the inequality is from the pluses and minuses in the table here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah this, is, uh, this is a strict, uh, strict inequality. Now, okay, so now for the, so then we have the space-like case is done, now for the time-like case. Let me maybe not erase this. So the time my case works in a very similar way. Start with a timeline holographic screen. We have two leaves which are very close to one another. 
sigma 1 and sigma 2, something like this. And we can shoot the k and l congruences from it. Of course, here they don't intersect, so we have to extend them towards the past. And we can consider extending this l congruence towards the past. So we can start out with sigma 2. And we can evolve it along the k-congruence towards this intersection, which I'll again call sigma tilde. And this looks, again, something like this. Now, then we can evolve it, as, as we did before, along the l-congruence. But this time, we're evolving towards the future. And the expansion of the l-congruence towards the future is negative. And so this time, the area will decrease as we evolve towards sigma 1. And so the area of sigma 2 is equal to the area of sigma tilde, but this is area is greater than the area of sigma 1. And so we find that the area increases along a time-like holographic screen as we evolve towards the past. And so now it becomes clear what we have to do in order to prove an area law for a holographic screen of indefinite signature. We have to make sure that if we're traveling along each piece of the holographic screen, in the direction in which the area is increasing, we don't end up doing something like this. And the bad transitions, I'll show you what they look like. Well, if you're traveling along some holographic screen and you start out with uh, traveling towards the past on it, then, oh, sorry, this is a good holographic screen, not what I want. All right, start out traveling along a, past, a future holographic screen in the outwards direction. And so this is a space-like one. You're traveling in the outwards direction. Area is increasing. And then all of a sudden, you're traveling towards the future on this holographic screen. And now area is decreasing. So the area is increasing in this direction. And it's increasing in this direction. And there's no way to continuously evolve along this screen in such a way that the area remains monotonic. Sorry, Another sorry. The other sorry. example is if you're evolving towards the future, if you're, sorry, if you're evolving towards the past here, and the area is increasing, and you have to evolve out towards the outside here, and the area is increasing in that direction. By contrast, you have also allowed transitions, like uh, the one that I erased, which was the, uh, the collapsing star. So this looks something like this. You're traveling towards the past, and then you're traveling outwards. Area is increasing in this direction, and also in this direction. Or you're traveling towards the future, and then you're traveling <coughs> inwards, where area is increasing in this direction, traveling outwards and then towards the past. So these are good. These are bad. There and a question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just want to ask, the, the, what you did so far, you didn't actually use any energy conditions, right? This was just like calculus, basically. This is, this um, the, to prove, so you're going to maybe need to use these, them now. But but these, these old results? Yeah, we will need the. Um, all of these assumptions mainly to show, uh, to get rather contradiction with focusing of GD6, which will have uh, this vanishing expansion on two ends. <coughs> but you didn't possible. use them yet. So, so I have not so used, space, like, I have not used these yet. Yeah, that's just right. Okay. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is uh, different from the case of the horizon thing in the sense of you, can, you cannot take any foliation, right? Yeah, there's a distinguished foliation, yeah. Yeah, if the, if the screen is null, which is ruled out by this condition, then, uh, then you can take any foliation you want, but not when, it's, when, not when this condition is obeyed, yeah. There's, in fact, you can prove there's this, yeah, this, this foliation is unique by marginally trapped surfaces and it's distinguished. Yeah. OK, so we want to rule out transitions like this. And what these have in common is that they're tangent to a vector that goes from being, in this case, outwards to being future directed or from being past directed to being inwards. And so we want to rule out things that do this. And what these have in common is they're both tangent to the vector k. We want to rule out. The, any transition, any holographic screen, which is tangent to the vector k. Sorry, so you're, the arrows don't seem consistent with what you Is wrote. it, sorry? Are you using <laughs> some convention where the arrow points forward for past? 
I mean, I'm just in the upper left one, it looks like it's going out and then it's going past. Uh, right. Yes, so the idea, it? right, so, so, the, so this is a forbidden transition precisely because. Oh, oh, so the thing you wrote is what you want, not what you want to rule out. This is what we, so this is, we want to be able to rule this out. We want uh, to not have a screen which evolves towards the past and then evolves inwards. I think you guys are speaking cross purposes. <laughs> your, your arrows indicate the, in the, in those pictures, indicate not the direction of flow, but the direction of increasing area. Oh, and, okay. and, um, and the lower, in the lower yeah. uh, lines, uh, Ned is talking about the direction of flow, so you don't want to be flowing for the past and then inward, uh -huh. or flowing towards the future and then uh, and then outward. Yeah, we uh, want to be regardless of what the areas are doing. That's sort of in the other pictures. Okay. Yeah. We want to be able to define a. <laughs> 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 we want to be able to define a tangent vector to the holographic screen which is normal to the foliation, and when you travel along that tangent vector, the area is always increasing. So it's clearly not possible in cases like this where the arrows point in different directions, but it is possible <coughs> where the arrows are consistent with one another and point in the same direction. I see. Yeah, the arrows are irrelevant from the point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we want to rule out these transitions where this vector, which is tangent to the holographic screen, is, uh, has a point where it's tangent to the vector k. Right. So now I'm going to show you a spherical symmetric proof for which I will first state the area theorem. And then those assumptions which I unfortunately just erased. <laughs> so a holographic screen, past or future, but not a union of the two. Or rather the area of a holographic screen. The area of leaves of a holographic screen is strictly monotonic. Along a continuous flow on the holographic screen. So the full proof is in this paper right here. And I'm not going to go through it, as I said. But the spherical symmetric case is very illuminating. So uh, let me try to convince you that we actually did what we said we did by t talking about the spherical symmetric case. So. So suppose we have uh, spherical symmetry in our space time and we have a holographic screen whose foliation by leaves respects this spherical symmetry. And suppose we have one of these violating transitions where the, this the holographic screen is somewhat tangent to the vector k. So this one, or this looks null. Or that one. So we can, in, when it's tangent to this vector k, we can find a leaf somewhere, say, here, such that when we shoot the null congruence in the k direction from it, this will intersect the screen somewhere here. This is because the screen is tangent to the vector k somewhere. And if it weren't, this would not obviously be true. So again, we can do the same thing here. In the case where we don't have spherical symmetry, it actually matters where we start, but with spherical symmetry, it doesn't. So this is, just, this is k, and this is also k. Now, because our foliation respects spherical symmetry, this intersection here with this null congruence, which I call n, is also a leaf. So I'll call this sigma 1, this sigma 2. Are these big enough for everyone to see? And this is sigma 1, I'll call this sigma 2. And these are really the same, the same idea. I'm just drawing both so you can see. So this, this null congruence n has an intersection on a complete leaf on this portion. And we know, by definition of a leaf, that the expansion of sigma 2 in the k direction has to be 0. 
And again, by definition of a leaf, the expansion of sigma 1 in the k direction has to be 0 as well. And then it's simple to see that if we start out with vanishing expansion here or here, and we have our generic condition, then the null rays must immediately focus. And so the expansion must be negative by the time it reaches sigma 1, which is, of course, a contradiction with the fact that we say that, by definition, it is 0. And so this gives us a contradiction and a proof in this very clear symmetric case. So what makes this so much more complicated when we don't have spherical symmetry? And the answer is that we're then not guaranteed that this intersection is a leaf. In fact, it gets even worse than that. We're not guaranteed that there's really any leaf which lies completely in one of these two portions. We could have leaves that lie both in the space-like portion and in this null transition region and also in the space-like portion. And so the way we roughly deal with this is with a lot of pain and agony. <laughs> uh, so let me just, I'm just going to focus on this case just to illustrate how this works. OK, so we, we actually have to make an assumption, which is that there exists at least one complete leaf, one leaf which is completely contained in this space-like region over here. And then we travel along the space-like region until we find the last leaf which has absolutely no intersection with the time-like portion, something over here. It could have an intersection with the null portion, but not with the time-like one. And we call this sigma 1. And then by just evolving a little bit up here, we have a leaf, sigma 1 plus epsilon, which by definition is going to have some intersection with the time-like portion. And then we consider this, the, again, this null congruence in the k direction. We shoot it down towards sigma. And we evolve the portion of sigma 1 plus epsilon, which lies in the time-like region, towards this null congruence. And we have a series of intermediate results which guarantee that this intersection exists, that it must begin in the interior, in, in this past region of this null surface, and end outside it. And so we have this intersection here. And we also are able to show that at this intersection, there is a leaf that lies entirely in this region, which is tangent to this surface. And because this must have vanishing expansion here, by the focusing we assumed, it is going to have positive expansion here. And so we have this leaf with vanishing expansion here, which is tangent to the surface with positive expansion. And from there, you can find a contradiction. Thanks I to hope Aaron. that. Uh, hmm? Thanks to Aaron. Thanks to Aaron, yes. I should cite Aaron's, Aaron's theorem from uh, uh, 2010, I believe. So if you, I urge you to look at all of the gory details of this proof <laughs> uh, in this paper. Any, any questions on the proof? So, so in the end of the day, all you needed was a little bit of the surface, right? You're basically looking at a neighborhood of a point or something yeah. that, that looked like the spherical case, and then you can yes. use the mm -hmm. spherical argument. Yeah, that's why the spherical case is so nice, because it captures the idea of the contradiction without having to go through all this, uh, this terrible business here. In the, if you're considering the semi-classical case, then you're going to need to make sure that it's, these lie not just one is like slightly outside the other in a neighborhood, but everywhere outside the other. But this is something that, in the unlikely case that I have time, I will talk about later. OK, so now let me talk about this thermodynamic interpretation. I spent a long time on this area theorem. And clearly, an area theorem is interesting. But it's even more interesting if we can assign some, uh, some other interpretation to it besides just, oh, it looks like the entropy. <coughs> so so bound for screens. Now I. Cleverly did not erase this figure because I knew I would need it later on. So let me remind you that this surface has four possible null expansions from it. And two of them will always be have non-positive expansion. So the statement of the Busso bound, which is a conjecture, states that for any one of these surfaces with, whose expansion is converging away from the surface, so not necessarily towards the future, but away from the surface, there is an entropy bound set by the area of the surface. 
So in, a little bit more precisely, uh, this is We say that a light sheet is a null hypersurface whose expansion away from, oh, let me call this surface B, is non positive. And for any such surface, for any co-dimension two surface, you're guaranteed to have two light sheets. But when your surface is marginally trapped, you're actually going to get three, because you have one. We have this one direction with the expansion zero, and so it's zero towards the future and it's zero towards the past, and so you have three light sheets from this surface. And the nice thing is that means that you have an entire null slice of the space-time, which is constrained by the entropy. So before I go there, let me just state what the bound actually is. So the states that the entropy of this light sheet L is less than or equal to the area of the surface B over 4. And if you have multiple light sheets, you can add them up and say the entropy of the two light sheets is the area of B over 2, for example. So how does this relate to? How is entropy defined? Uh, sorry? How are you defining entropy? Uh, I'm just talking about the thermodynamic entropy here. We're in classical GR, and suddenly we're in thermodynamics. Yeah. This is the entropy of matter fields falling across the surface. Now you, you can wonder. Computed how? I mean, there are some issues with trying to define exactly what you mean by the entropy on a null surface, but that's at least notionally the matter entropy. Yeah. At least, at least well. in a hydrodynamic regime, you can use it, classical thing. I mean, I, I, you never actually gave a precise. <laughs> <laughs> You're bound. You should be telling <laughs> Why is this my problem? In the cosmological settings, or you know, when a star is collapsing, you know, you know it when you see it. I mean, you can, you know what the entropy is. I um, don't know. And it's a, <laughs> Sorry. It, it, it's you know, you compute an entropy density and you integrate it. So. So, so that's, of course, only an approximation. And, and in, in recent years, largely starting with the work of Cassini, we've learned how to make this more precise. And uh, one, one way to make it more precise is in the weakly gravitating setting, where uh, you, can, you can regulate away the divergence. So you really compute a von Neumann entropy of the state restricted to the light sheet. You have a divergent part. And you get rid of that by subtracting the von Neumann entropy of the vacuum restricted to the light sheet. That's one thing you can do, and in that case, you can actually prove the bound. Um, the other thing that, that, that I'm exploring with, uh, with Aaron and with uh, Stefan Leichenauer and Zach Fisher is basically rearrange the terms in the bound. So this is basically uh, as, as, as a, a statement that the generalized entropy is uh, non-increasing. Uh, so the way that you get a well-defined statement that's caught up independent is by grouping together von Neumann entropy of a density uh, operator with, uh, with, with the geometric terms of Wittgenstein Hawking entropy, and then arguing that the sum of the two is always well defined, even if individually they're, they're cut off dependent. And in fact, it's that, it, it's unpublished work that Netta may be referring to in the end, which allows you to prove the quantum version of, this state, of these statements. Um, it's, it's a covariant bound in that form. So it is, I mean, what you're asking is obviously incredibly important. That's the heart of trying to make progress. Well, this is called the Busso bound, so I just had a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so what does this mean for holographic screens? Because holographic screens have light sheets in two directions, in the two marginally trapped directions, we have an entropy bound on a light sheet which is not just sort of this half of the surface, but uh, both sides of it. 
So let me draw an example. In this case, of the collapsing star. We have this holographic screen. And we have this null foliation by light sheets. Then the area of these marginally trapped surfaces sets a bound on the entropy of this light sheet and also this light sheet and the sum of these two light sheets. So the area of this is a bound on this null, on this entire null surface, which is a slice of the space time. So if you're used to thinking about uh, a space-like bound, just kind of tilt your head 45 degrees and hopefully this will all make sense. So now in the black hole case, we see that since the area is increasing in this direction, we have this funny situation where the bound on the entropy of these light sheets is increasing first towards the past and then in a space-like direction, which is certainly not what we expect from usual entropy considerations. But in the case of the past holographic screen, which is time-like, so this matter-dominated FRW universe with this future holograph, this past holographic screen, then the entropy of these light sheets is increasing towards the future. And so this the bound on the entropy, I should say, is increasing towards the future because the area of this thing is increasing in this direction. And so it sort of, it makes sense, it fits in with our intuitions for cosmological space times, but it's hard to say what it means, what this bound means in the case of black hole space times. And I encourage discussion on this subject if anybody has something to say or some interpretation to give as to what this means. No one? Just start calling names? <laughs> Just this sort of state. I think this is something you, you mentioned to me before. Um, yes, it looks funny if you say that it's sort of you know increasing to the past and then increasing out. But in terms of your holographic screen, oh, well, in ter no, in terms of your light sheets, mm -hmm. it seems to be uniformly decreasing as you fall into the black hole. Right. You mean if you're doing this? Yeah, oh, the, yeah if you just yeah, yeah. look at those null surfaces foliating inside of the black hole, the entropy is decreasing mm -hmm. uniformly as you go in, regardless of where it actually hits your holographic screen. Yes. yes. So I guess as you lose more and more of the singularity, you lose more and more. As you lose the singularity, yeah. you lose the entropy. Good. Perhaps you can say that the whole light sheet is like a Cauchy surface for a region of space-time, and this space-time region decreases as you decrease the area. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, if this, this number is some kind of <coughs> relative entropy, it's natural. Right? It's, it's so yeah. it depends on what is the entropy, so exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, so I conversely, in the cosmological case, you can sort of think of degrees of freedom as coming in from the singularity uh -huh. as you move up your, your slicing and sort of scrapes across the singularity and picks up more and more. But, uh, you know, it'd be nice to understand that. These two surfaces, the past and the future one, always closes some, like, piece of the space-time or can it end it anywhere? Or? I think, well, sorry, could you, I'm not sure I know, I know what you mean. I wish no, I understand. I mean, it, it, if it goes to infinity or it can... Well, it can, it can certainly uh, end if you encounter a caustic. If the He's asking about the intermediate <coughs> results we had about k plus and k minus. So one thing that Nella didn't have time to mention mm -hmm. in a finite time is that we, we do assume that these surfaces, one of the technical assumptions is that each leaf splits a Cauchy surface into two pieces. Okay, and, and we, we prove that when that is the case, then the associated pair of null uh, of, of light sheets uh, this is actually true whether or not it's marginally trapped, although it's don't really have to be light sheets, uh, uh, splits the entire space time into two pieces. So then the answer is yes. It's always true that it, 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 it sort of breaks off. But it remains to be a, a light sheet there. So. You mean you never have caustics? No, 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 no you, you have caustics, but they, the the that's, but you know, it's a, it's, the, it's a property of the boundary of the future, so, you know, the, the other light rays fill it in. Well, the boundary of the future splits it into two pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I also get a bound on the entropy of the interior of this. Uh, by interior, what do you mean in this picture? 
So you're talking about scraping along the sin. Raphael is talking about scraping along the singularity if you're looking at the outside of the holographic screen. Like here? You could also look at the inside of the holographic screen and sure. find. Well, that mean, you mean the, the part that's foliated yeah. by these? Yeah. So well, yeah, you also get a bond on that. The whole surface is as a whole, actually. I mean, well, again, this, this is a, a bunch of, this is a foliation, right? And I'm just saying that the foliation, in some sense, gets bigger in that it picks up more and more information coming in from the uh, singularity. Well, yes, right. but you also get a, you get a bound also on this these in the interior because those you don't have to think about the two halves of the light sheet you can just think of half of it and that's give, that bound is given by the area of a four the two if you take the union of the two light sheet that bound is given by the area of a two so yeah so you can think of this as a bound on the entropy just in the interior of the holographic screen was that your question yeah yeah and it seems less uh, less uh, intuitive since uh huh. It's not just that you're getting more and more of the singularity. Well, the, the surface moves out, so it actually gets to a yeah. larger columbic radius. Yeah, so the interior sure. is getting bigger. I'm not it's saying it's false. I'm just yeah. saying it's weird in the way you know, the general law, the second law is always weird. That you might expect that the information could just fall out, but somehow it, the surface keeps track of it. Yes. Well, since I have a little bit of time, uh, I'm going to talk about future directions. So as Aaron has taught us in the, in the past, uh, we can think of these trapped or marginally trapped surfaces in the context of semi-classical gravity by replacing the area in the expansion, replacing the idea of the area decreasing along a congruence by the idea of the generalized entropy decreasing. So when I say the generalized entropy, I mean the area of a four plus the entropy of the exterior, and this is all evaluated on some Cauchy surface. So in 2010, Aaron defined a quantum trapped surface as a surface whose generalized entropy decreased in the future, along the future uh, null congruences shot from the surface. And along the same vein, you can also describe quantum marginally trapped surfaces. I'm not even going to write that down. So S out here means the entanglement entropy? Uh, it can mean the entanglement entropy. Uh, if you're talking about the case of, say, a minimally coupled scalar field, then this is exactly the, uh, the von Neumann entropy. But you can run into all kinds of questions if you try to think of this as the von Neumann entropy of uh, gauge fields and, uh, and so on. But it, in the simple case of the minimally coupled scalar field, this is exactly the von Neumann entropy. So a quantum marginally trapped surface is one where the generalized entropy along one of the future directions is neither, ex neither uh, greater nor less. It's, like it's, change it's staying constant on some small uh, infinitesimal changes. And so you can think of defining a quantum future holographic screen or a quantum past holographic screen as one which is foliated by these quantum marginally trapped surfaces. And you might ask, well, what do we really gain when we do that? Well, we gain a thermodynamic interpretation because the generalized second law is formulated in terms of the generalized entropy. And so if we can construct these surfaces where, on which the generalized entropy is always increasing in a certain direction, it's like we've constructed a generalized second law for surfaces which are not causal horizons. And this is very nice because it gives us a way of talking about the generalized second law in space times where, one, we don't have causal horizons or where the generalized second law is not known to hold. And we expect that we can prove that the generalized entropy indeed increases. And this depends on, uh, this hangs on a quantum focusing conjecture, which says that if you start out with, it, that the null rays will focus the generalized entropy. This is thanks to uh, Raphael Aaron, Zach Fisher, and Stefan Leichenauer. And using that conjecture in some quantum generic condition, we expect to be able to prove this uh, generalized second law for these locally defined surfaces. So uh, stay tuned.
discussion about how when a time-like holographic screen meets a space-like one, the area goes monotonically through with the generic condition. Um, but I think it's true, and someone will probably tell me immediately if I'm wrong, that if you take the bifurcation surface of the inner horizon of uh, riser Nordstrom and perturb it, that what you'll find is two time-like holographic screens that meet at the extremal surface. And, would... okay. and in that case, as you say, if you have two that meet at an extremal surface, you, one, the area of the one toward the future necessarily increases this way, and the one down here has to increase this way. Uh, I guess that depends. Generically, I would expect that. Yeah, I mean, that depends. You, you can have the so these marginally trapped surfaces and an extremal surface and more marginally trapped surfaces. But if you have marginally anti-trapped and marginally trapped separated by an extremal surface, then... So you can't have marginally trapped surfaces separated by an extremal surface? Why not? I don't understand. Well, you can. I was saying you, you can. You can. Yeah. So is this like uh, the, the central... So in a closed universe, there's a central two-sphere, you know, an equator of the maximum expansion time where two time-like uh, screens meet. Oh, is it true there as well? So, so there oh, you yes. have an yes, yeah. That's right. so the extremal surface, by our definition, is yes. not part of the screen. Right. And but, and but the two screens are meeting there. Yeah, they're but, meeting but there. And one is a past screen, and the other is a future screen. What and makes the area a past holds screen? What's a future screen? What's the definition? Uh, so the future mar future by marginally trapped, trapped or marginally anti-trapped. So you have to consider each separately. You're not allowed to join them. I guess I don't understand. If I have the inner horizon of Riser Nordstrom, mm -hmm. which is where there are two null things that cross. And there's a this entire thing is a future holographic screen. This one's a past holographic. Not if the not if the center of the X is an extremal surface. I think actually I have four. Oh, I see. You see, these there. are both future holographic screens, and these are past mm -hmm. holographic screens. You have to perturb them also to satisfy the generic condition. So, but but yes, that you can get. But, but you what, you, what you won't be able to avoid is that they're really past and future screens that are meeting each other, and we're not allowing you to consider them together. You that's, just, to, that's just a rule. That's just a rule. And it's similar to, you know, right. these are analogs of the past and future event horizon for that yeah. other area law. Okay. And obviously that area law goes in different directions whether you consider one well, or the that's other. That's fair enough. But it's still, yeah. an, it's an example though, I think, if these two, do, if they do, if, where, okay, wherever two time-like screens meet, it's an example where you start flowing along the direction of increasing area, mm -hmm. and then your screen just stops and mm -hmm. can't be continued. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does that... Play nicely with aerodynamic interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> <Green> Wonderful. <line. laughs> Good. Uh, so, so when you, when you have this situation, which way is the area flowing again? Is it coming? Uh, so the area is increasing in this direction and in this Air direction. The center. So the extremal surface. Towards the extremal surface, yeah. yeah. Right. No question. Oh well, I, I was just curious. So you were saying that these things are not teleological. But if, if I just locally, you know, have some point where the expansion, you know, you know, that, sat that locally satisfies this condition, do I always know that it's part of the, one of these holographic screens, or do I actually have to know about the future? I think I do. Mm -hmm. You don't know about the future. You have to know yeah. about regions that are space-like yeah. separate from it. It will yeah. close the surface. Yeah, I guess that was. But no, but the surface can close in a time-like way, right? Like because it can become time-like, right? So then. I think it's like it's more of a positive statement. You can. You can establish. Uh, so for a, for an event horizon, if I give you the space time up to a certain time, yeah. you have absolutely no way of telling whether something is an event horizon. Yeah. Here, if I give you the evolution of the universe up to a certain time, yeah. but spatially over an extended reason, then you can identify holographic screens, and anything happens in the future will not change the fact that those are holographic Sorry. screens. But, I thought but holographic it could be that you're missing like some that will only exist because of something that happens later. Yeah, so that, that could happen. I see. That so, could happen. So it's and, a little and, and so and so be it. No, I mean I think in that case you would say, well, those holographic screens really in their entirety only start existing later, and no, it's no, okay. There can can't there be holographic screens that have pieces of each leaf below the Cauchy surface you've studied so far, but yeah. where pieces go up higher? Yeah, yeah so that's, that's what just, I'm referring. That's what I was right, asking so, about. So 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 even though so the even though a piece of each leaf of the holographic screen exists below this surface you want to say that the holographic screen doesn't exist until after this surface. You won't know that it exists. So well, why not? Yeah. I can. It, it doesn't, I mean, given that amount of space time, you don't know that it exists. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And, and, well, yeah. Why can't you just identify whether it obeys these conditions? Because you don't yet have a closed surface that obeys these conditions. It's, it's it is an, a 
I mean, we call it quasi-local following, I guess, Ashtekar and these people. Yeah. Uh, it's not exactly completely local, right? Because locally, you can always find a piece of a marginally trapped surface. Yeah, you did an entire uh, neighborhood yeah, that was it. My it, it. It's very important that, that it has to close off. It, it's a compact. Why uh, is that important? Um, be, because, again, otherwise it's a trivial statement. That you can always find these things. Oh, is that the fact that you can always find them, I don't see that's bad. The fact that you can always find Rindler horizons and then cast these things doesn't mean we Well, we also can't about prove them. anything about them, so that's why. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody else, I mean, right, I mean, the reason that there are all these theorems about trap surfaces is that trapped has a, has a compact, the word compact. But a lot of things you can prove about them don't require it to be compact. Did the your proof require compact? compact? Where did compactness come into this argument? Uh, that, that, well, that comes into the argument of uh, the more complicated. Proof. We, we need it when we evolve something along the holographic screen. We need the compactness to get a contradiction, thanks to Aaron's theorem. The intersection of n with <laughs> the holographic screen, you have to prove uh, that a certain maximum is actually attained. I see. And, you know, the usual way in which compactness actually. But, but you didn't use it until then. Uh, well, so what? <laughs> <laughs> I have another point where we needed a contradiction, and that's what we used it. <laughs> well, I mean, for example, you didn't need it for just getting the area along the time like piece or the space like piece, right? Well, that was just calculus. That was just calculus. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that was yeah. almost trivial, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, it follows by definition. Yeah. Do you know there's actual counterexamples when it isn't closed, or is it just you don't know how to prove it unless it's closed? Uh, well, if it's not closed, then what would stop you from, I mean, why would there be an area theorem, right? I could take a piece of a marginally trapped surface and then take a smaller piece of the next marginally trapped surface. I mean, well, you have to no define constraint. something about the boundary, I guess. You, so you, well, you have to worry about whether, uh, maybe, maybe you'd have, to, you'd have to, to, to think about whether there's any sort of net flow of area no. out of infinity or Sorry. not. Let, let me correct. Maybe you're thinking about ADS. If you're thinking about ADS, then it may be possible to include the boundary in, in, in a sense that would effectively compactify the surfaces we're interested in and allow you to make interesting statements. I, the thing that clearly won't go anywhere is if you take little pieces of trap surfaces, you know, yeah. and string those together into a piece of a hypersurface. Um, because there you can just choose randomly how big you no, make no, no, wait, wait. So, so, I mean, the Hawking area theorem is a local theorem on each generator, which has implications for non-compact surfaces as well. Is your statement that, in your case, you don't know how to identify the equivalent of a generator that links a, a portion of one leaf with a portion of the next, and it's really very arbitrary? Or you... No. Ah, good. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I would thought you uh, could. Uh, and yeah, you so you could use the generators. No, in fact, there is a yeah. generator structure. You could you could use that. And we do make yeah. use of that, actually. Um, however, that zigzag argument for why the area uh, grows, there might be a subtlety there. Because, uh, you know, the generators don't have to match up on the intersecting surface. And so it, it may be not... So, um, well, I'm, I'm not thinking. It would require some thinking, but right, it's, right. it's a great right. but you direction could, to explore. At least say maybe there's an area theorem up to some boundary term, or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a possibility. That's interesting. So, is anything known about? So, in the time like case, we've seen that these surfaces can just end someplace. In the space-like case, is anything known about whether these surfaces can just end in the direction of increasing area? I think Some again, kind of an extremal surface they, sitting something like right yeah, here? I, I, think, I think you can also find examples where they end in the direction of decreasing area, but maybe I'm wrong about that. What happens with the mm -hmm. extremal yeah, you can. surface? Yeah, there are examples of all of those things. Yeah. So, so it also can end the in the direction of increasing surface? area? Yeah. Uh, in the space-like case? Yeah. Yeah, so if you have a... Uni if, a, if you have a closed universe recollapsing with p equals rho, then that will happen. I see. They'll be space-like, and they'll they'll still you know they'll they'll, they'll still be, be an x, but it'll be a flatter x than that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah, and then with the sitter, if you perturb the sitter slightly, uh, then it'll begin on an extremal surface and get larger from there out. So so unlike the usual second law of thermodynamics, we can't continue it for sort of arbitrary time. It, it, it stops for, at various places for some. Yeah, I mean, even here it doesn't respect the uniform time flow, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, but it, it, it kind of goes down and then... You gave us a new kind of flow when we discussed yeah, the yeah, yeah. flow. Yeah, yeah, so that's the only flow, and yeah, that it can run into a, a barrier. A barrier. Okay, let's thank Nadia again.